Hi, good evening, everybody. And welcome back for another MS Views Now virtual online program from MS Views and News. We have a great, great expert speaker talking this evening. Her name is Mitzi Joy Williams. And Mitzi is phenomenal in the subjects that we're gonna be speaking, well, she's gonna be speaking about tonight. Okay, so tonight's program, again, um, this is an MS Views and News program. It's called MS Views Now. It's a series that we began after the pandemic started and it was primarily, primarily to be about COVID-19 and multiple sclerosis and the what's relative to each month. So, you know, we ask our, our presenters to come on and, and bring you up to date of what's going on. So though, for tonight's program, I do wanna let everybody know that, you know, we are supported by big corporations. And fortunately, we do have this support to be able to do what we are doing. So for tonight's program, I just wanna thank Biogen and Genentech and EMD Serono, Bristol Myers Squibb and Santa Fe Genzyme for their support. Yay, round of applause virtually. Great job, thank you everybody. All right, tonight, we have, as I said, Mitzi Joy Williams. She is from the Atlanta area and she does have her own MS center called Joy of Life. Actually, it's a wellness center that she's got in Atlanta. Um, she'll tell you a little bit more about herself as we get into this program. But um, I just wanted to let you all know that we will be doing this as we do all the MS Views and News programs. So Dr. Williams will be speaking for approximately 10 minutes, more or less. All right, and then we're gonna take questions on that topic. All right, and you could type them in online. All right, I also have three pages of notes already of people that have asked questions. And then we'll do Q&A for a little while, and then we'll get back to having Dr. Williams speak for another approximate 10 minutes. All right, and then we'll take more questions. And again, she'll speak for another 10 minutes, and then we'll do more questions after that. So the first group is about MS in underserved and minority communities. The second grouping will be about inclusive research. And the third grouping will be about COVID-19 and multiple sclerosis, okay? So let's let Dr. Williams get started and I'll see you all in a little bit when we do get back here for the Q&A, okay? Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Stuart, for that um, rousing start to the program. I'm so excited to be here with everyone tonight and to talk about some subjects that are very near and dear to my heart and to the work that I've been uh, focused on for the past, gosh, for most of my career. So I am a neurologist and multiple sclerosis specialist. I am outside of Atlanta, Georgia, and I started my own practice, Joy Life Wellness Group, a couple of years ago, and I also work um, at one of our major teaching hospitals with residents and students from our two major medical schools here in Atlanta. So I see a lot of MS. I've been um, seeing MS for my whole career, and I've really uh, been fortunate to have some great opportunities to focus on some of the populations that are very commonly seen in my practice, such as people in underserved minority communities, um, as well as those who are in the aging MS population. So I'm excited. Let's go ahead and let's just get right into it. Okay, so when we think about the prevalence of MS, and this is just kind of an introductory slide, you know, the most common area where we see the most MS is still in Europe, okay? So we see high incidence or prevalence of MS in the UK. Here, we can see that on the right hand of this map here. Um, certainly in Scandinavia, the prevalence is very high and in the rest of Europe. However, if we look at the US, our numbers are pretty significant as, there as well. So our numbers in the US in terms of prevalence are very similar to what's seen throughout the rest of Europe and Canada is a little bit higher than we are. If we look at the population, for instance, in Africa, there are very few cases of MS that are reported, which is one of the challenges with understanding MS in people of African descent because we don't have a lot of information about um, the continent of origin. When we switch gears and talk about MS specifically in the US and kind of narrow that down, the MS Society did a, a prevalence study last year that showed us that there are nearly a million people in the United States with MS. And this is what many of us in the MS community suspected, but the numbers that we were using was 400,000. So all of a sudden we went from 400,000 to nearly a million. So there are many more people living and battling MS than we originally thought here in the United States. Now, when we think about the risk for MS in the United States, the population is a little bit different. So overall, 
the most common group of people to develop MS are people of Northern European descent. If we look at Europe and we look at the United States, but when we look at the risk for MS and also look at the incidence, which is the occurrence of MS uh, based on the number of people within that population, we see a little bit of a different profile than what we see in Europe. So here in the US, there are studies that suggest that the risk for MS may be up to 47% higher in black women, which is very contrary to what many of us in the MS community were taught coming along through school and training um, and what we thought was the case um, once we got out into practice. Next slide. So this is just another graphic that gives us a little bit more detail, but we can see here um, with the blocks, we can see this is based on the US. So we can see the white population is the dark blue, black is green. We can see the Hispanic is the kind of blue green color and Asian Pacific is the very, very light um, blue color. So if we look at the population, if we look at the total over here on the left of the graph, we can see that the incidence of MS, okay, so that's based on the percentage or the number of people in that area, um, is highest in black people, okay, compared to whites, then whites are next, and then the Hispanic population is significantly less than both groups, and then the Asian Pacific Islander population is the lowest incident. And when we break that down, looking at females and looking at males, or looking at men and women, we can see that really the distinguishing factor is in the group of females, okay? So we can see there's a significant difference there in the female group, but when we look at the male group, it's a little bit higher in the black population, but not quite as much as what we see in the female group. So that's what's really driving the differences in the incidence or occurrence of MS is the, uh, the incidence or occurrence in black women. Why is this important, right? You know, so it's certainly important because of the potential outcomes that we see. Right, so it's important, number one, to include everybody in the research and our understanding of MS, but it's important because when we look at the outcomes, the outcomes are a little bit different. Now, I'm not gonna give a whole talk about MS and minority groups, but we can see here from this graph, if we look at mortality, so this is a study that was performed by Dr. Liliana Amescua um, at USC, and when they looked at mortality, meaning a group of people whose primary cause of demise or cause of death was listed as MS, right? Um, and they looked at kind of who had the highest risk of mortality at certain age ranges. Now, when we look at the overall group, we can see that the bar that's highest is in the white population, which we would expect because most of the people in the US who have MS are white. But when we look at the black population line, which is that second line, if we look at the younger ages, we can see that the mortality is higher in those ages, let's say looks like between 20 to about 45, we can see that the mortality is higher in the black population. So it's important to try to understand the outcomes because we see that there, in some cases, may be worse outcomes in this group. So how do we kind of think about when we think about underserved populations? So certainly it's important to look at um, differences in outcomes to see why some people may do worse than others. I think one of the biggest questions when we look at minority groups or when we look at other underserved populations within the MS community, whether it's people over the age of 55, um, whether it is pediatric populations, you know, it's important to kind of understand that there are some things that may be related to a biologic basis, which we don't really understand the biology in different groups um, as much as we would like to. Um, but a lot of what we see in terms of outcomes have to do with social determinants of health. And this is just kind of a general list of social determinants of health, such as access to education and economic opportunities, access to healthcare services, right? If people don't live near an MS center or have access to an MS specialist, or even access to a neurologist that may affect their care. Things like transportation, right? You have to be able to get to the doctor. You have to be able to take a day off of work, especially if it's a visit that you have to have a certain type of medication that may take several hours. There also has to be social support. What about childcare while you're at your doctor's visit or while you're receiving your infusion or medication? And then also language and literacy can make a big difference, especially when you begin to talk about things like clinical trials and enrollment in clinical trials. And also access to mass media is important important, cell phones, internet, especially in this age of COVID, when much of our care is delivered via telemedicine.
medicine. So if you don't have access to the technology, if you don't have, let's say, a good internet connection, or if you don't really know how to operate your cell phone or even have a smartphone, it can really limit your access to care, which can really affect the long-term outcomes. So when we think about the treatment and care of people with MS, it's important when we talk about underserved to not just limit it to minority populations, but to also look at socioeconomic status and other factors that may affect healthcare outcomes. This is a great study that was done in 2008, and it talked about the access to neurologists by people who were living with MS. So it's a little dated, but I think still a valuable study. And so what they looked at or what they proposed is that if someone has access to at least a neurologist, now we're not even talking about an MS specialist and they have MS, there are certain things that are usually in place. They are more likely to be on a disease modifying therapy if appropriate. They're more likely to have management of symptoms and more likely to have a treatment plan if let's say the treatment they're taking um, fails. And when we look at the characteristics of people that are less likely to see a neurologist, this really describes some of our underserved populations, right? So people with lack of health care insurance, people of lower socioeconomic status, we could see number three there is African American explicitly, okay? People living in rural areas, again, transportation, access to specialists, and people having the illness longer than 15 years. So what happens to the person who may have progressive disease and may not be on a therapy, but still needs management of their different symptoms? They also need access and care from a neurologist so that they can have um, their daily life hopefully improved by different treatment options. So this is just kind of a start of the conversation. I know we're not gonna be able to cover it all tonight. And what I'll do is I'll invite Stuart to come back and we'll see if there are any questions about this section, um, talking specifically about some of the underserved populations, particularly some of our minority populations. Hi, I'm back. How are you I all? see you. Great, good, I'm glad that you can. So we do have, let's see, based on the minority uh, questions that we have here, we have the first one is, can you offer information on a black registry and minority research? Yes, in the next section, you you got ahead of me, but I am gonna talk about an African-American registry in the next session. Of okay, well, we'll skip that one for now. All right, is there a registry for minority doctors who treat MS? So that's a great question. Um, there is not that I know of. There are some efforts uh, for people to collaborate who are interested in research of this type. I know that there is um, a, a coalition uh, for people who are interested in uh, doing research on the Hispanic Latinx community, and that's called the ARMS Collaboration, and we're in the process of developing one for those who are interested um, or doing work in the African American community. Um, if you think about different minorities, so, you know, in terms of, let's say, you know, African American or Black MS doctors, they're very few in the country. So they're probably, they're less than 20. And I probably know almost all of them <laughs> since I'm a social butterfly. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done in, in some of our groups in terms of representation. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Is there anywhere that people can apply for financial aid for phones, computers, tablets, things like that? So that's a great question. You know, I always encourage folks to seek any type of uh, information like that from our societies. Um, so I am not aware of a fund specifically for technological needs, but often if you look, um, you know, at the MS Society, the MS Foundation, the MS Association, they do have different funds, um, one of which I just recognize that someone was doing one for transportation. I believe the MS Foundation um, has a grant for transportation to doctor's visits. So these things are changing all of the time. Um, so it's important to stay connected in those veins to see if there are funds that are available. Um, to help with some of those services. Thank you. Um, so going back to the MS Foundation, they are providing grants or, or services to get people to their neurology appointments. Mm -hmm. I think it's only neurologists, not, uh, not all doctors in general. So, gotcha. so uh, gotcha. just, you know, people, gotcha. you know, for anybody, if you don't know how to connect with the MS Foundation, you could always just send an email to me and I'll get that information to you as well, okay? All right, so the next question, is there a local minority organization 
in my area, but I don't know what area this person was in, that serves minorities with multiple sclerosis. So, so again, checking in. Yeah, so, so again, uh, I don't know of patient, uh, I would say local minority organizations. There often are support groups um, that are either centered around certain groups, whether it's an ethnic minority group or certain themes. So I would say, you know, check with your local society and see about support groups in your area or look within the MS community. I know Stuart has a great, amazing network of people all around the country that may be aware of some of the local support groups that may be targeted um, or, you know, for specific groups of folks. Great. Thank you for that. Uh, what can be done for minorities to maximize their health as well as health care? Right. I think one of the most important things that I encourage all of my patients, whether they are minority patients or not, is to be empowered. Right. And empowerment includes coming to programs like this, like the ones that MS Views and News puts on to educate yourself, to understand different aspects of MS and the disease, and then to advocate for yourself when you go to the doctor, you know, knowing kind of what are some of the new things that are going on or asking those questions. I think also much of what you can do to take care of your brain and improve brain health are the things that we usually do to improve overall health. So eating a healthy, well-balanced diet, trying to get in a little exercise, whatever that looks like for you, um, trying to get enough sleep at night, trying to keep stress levels low, whether that's through yoga or meditation or a hobby that you enjoy, taking care of our mental health. So all of those things will help our overall health um, and also help our brain health, in addition to staying connected with your healthcare provider to make sure your MS treatment plan is the right one for you. Thank you. This next one is a little bit, um, I, I'm, I might have difficulty asking it, so I'll, I'll leave it up to you because you're a doctor to okay. figure it out. Okay. Okay. That is looking to get life expectancy, EDSS differences in underserved communities versus others. Can you please discuss this? Yes. So when we talk about EDSS or disability scale, it's a scale that is more commonly used in research, we are using it more and more in general practice. And so it is basically to help kind of measure how much disability someone has. And there are different parts of the EDSS. It's basically a very detailed neurologic exam, which hopefully everyone has gotten at some point in time. And so we're able to kind of come up with a number that tells us, okay, this is a lot of disability, this is a little bit of disability. One of the difficulties with EDSS is that it's very focused on walking. So if you you only have walking disability and no other disability, you can have a super high score. Whereas if you have severe cognitive problems and maybe no walking disability, your score can be very low. So when we look at minority populations, one of the major milestones we look at is an EDSS of six, which is when you get to the point where you need assistance with walking. And there are studies that suggest, at least in the black population, that um, black people can reach an EDSS of six anywhere from six to 10 years earlier than their white counterparts here in the US. So there are some differences in disability from some of the research that we have. And then I forgot the first part of the question. The first part of the question was about... The first was about life expectancy. Life expectancy. So the life expectancy with people with MS is slightly shorter compared to the general population. There are some studies that report it may be, you know, six, five to 10 years, a little bit shorter. Um, but overall, people with MS can be, live a, a almost normal lifespan. And when we talk about people who have mortality due to complications from MS, it most commonly is related to the level of disability and people who may pass away, pass away for the same reasons that people who are very disabled from other conditions pass away, infections. Okay, thank you. All right, so that mm -hmm. takes us to the end of the questions for that first subject. And now All right. we can continue with the next one, okay? All Great. right, part I'm two. Signing off, you let's tell me go. when to come on again, all right? Thank you. You got it, I'll do you. it. Okay, so let's talk about clinical trials. So this is extremely important because much of the information that we get about MS in the population, much of what we understand about how the disease behaves, people's responses to different treatments is through clinical trial experience because these are the most controlled trials. And when we talk about controlled trials, 
generally we mean nobody knows if somebody's on treatment or not on treatment. Um, there are people who independently examine people. Everybody has access to doctor's visits. Everybody has access to their MRI scans. Everybody has access to some form of treatment. And so these are very important studies because they help us to understand MS and they really kind of level the playing field and eliminate many of those social determinants of health that can really de you know, lead to poor outcomes. So it really allows us to see how people perform with medication um, and kind of the similar circumstances of their access to care. This was an interesting study that I was um, fortunate to be the second author on that came out in Mitzi, 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 I got to stop you for a minute. Population with MS. Mitzi? So if we, yeah, you can't hear Excuse me? Give me a second. No, actually, I can hear you right now, but nobody can hear you. Are you in mute by any chance? Everybody's writing uh, in. We lost the sound. Okay. No. Okay. I'm trying to get this okay. resolved. I know Bill can is online as me? well. Hello, I can hello, hear you hello. through here. You can, can hear, hear me? How about here, everybody else? can hear. So somebody just Type wrote better chat. now. All right, people are writing. We can hear again. Yay! You hear me? Great. Okay. Awesome. So, yeah. but, okay. Thanks, dear. You, get, you better start. I'll you got to start your talk again from the beginning of this slide. Okay. You got it. Okay. Great. Thank you. Perfect. Bye. Sorry, guys. I've got my Janet Jackson mic on today, and sometimes she gives me a little bit of trouble. All right. So let's go back to the top of this one. So what I was saying is that this is a study that we did in 2015, and we looked at the percentage of papers that were written about MS in the minority community. And so out of 50,000 or more, 50 to 60,000 articles that have been written about MS in the minority community, there were only a little over 100 about Black people with MS and there were less than 50 about MS in Hispanic and Latinx communities. This is important because number one, most of these papers were not clinical trials. And if we look at our clinical trials, there is less than 1% enrollment. There's you know, anywhere from five to you know, 8% enrollment of minorities in these trials. So when we talk about trying to understand MS, especially in these clinical trials, which are very controlled settings as we talked about in the last slide, we don't have a lot of information about MS in these groups. Other groups that we don't have a lot of information about are people who are over the age of 55, because most of our trials magically stop at the age of 55. And then we don't have very much information about the pediatric population, so people less than 18. And so it's important for us to examine our clinical trials because we're missing a lot of information and we're actually missing a lot of people that we're treating in real life. And it makes it difficult to generalize these results if everyone is not included. So why is this important? So this slide specifically is an article talking about why it's important to have diversity in clinical trials of minority patients, but this really could apply to many of the other groups that we just discussed. So these groups are underrepresented in clinical trials, ethnic minority groups, people over the age of 55, people under the age of 18, um, and unique differences in these populations, whether they're environmental, cultural, or physiologic, factors can certainly be missed. And then because we don't have that diversity, which enriches our research and our understanding, we may not be able to fully generalize our findings. And it leaves us with not understanding what to do in these populations that are outliers and not in our original studies.
So this was a really cool survey that we did with a group um, called the MS Minority Research Partnership Engagement Network. So it's a really cool collaboration of people living with MS, uh, physicians, researchers, industry partners from pharma companies, all of our advocacy groups have representatives. And so we did a survey looking at people's interest in research because certainly there is a lot of mistrust, especially among some of the minority communities, but sometimes in general about research and what will be done with information and things like that. And so when we did this survey of about 2,600 people, overall, most people had very positive um, impressions or thoughts about research. So these are some of the words here in this graphic that describe kind of what people thought of or what they said in the kind of free flowing answers about research. Cure, um, trying, trials, thinking, um, clinical medicine, help, right? So overall kind of positive impressions. So when we think about inclusive research, I think that the next step is to look at what ways can we be more inclusive in the type of research that we do. Um, I think that there are many who are starting to look at the age group of people over 55, especially because as we age, our immune system ages. And so what are the effects of some of the medications as our immune system is aging? Are people at more risk for infections or other type of outcomes? Um, and then also there's the question, when I was coming along in residency, there was this thought that MS kind of burns out after a while, meaning after a while, people don't have any changes. But in, at least in my clinical experience, I very rarely found that to be true. But we're trying to get the actual scientific evidence to understand that. So things that we can look at are looking at trials or studies that are specific to our um, older populations and maybe extending the age or criteria for admission into some of our trials. It's also important um, on the research side to review the inclusion and exclusion criteria. So for instance, some people with comorbidities like diabetes or high blood pressure may be excluded from trials and minority patients largely have some of these comorbidities. So how do we um, uh, extend our criteria so that more people can be included? Because even though we, uh, you know, ideally would want, you know, perfect candidates in our trials, these are not the people that we're seeing and treating on a daily basis. Other things that are important are expanding research sites, right? So again, if you keep going to the same places, you keep getting the same thing. And so we certainly want to include our large academic centers that are very good at enrolling, but also maybe look at some of those community groups and kind of helping them build up their practice so that we will have access to a more diverse population. It's also important to improve awareness and education about trials that are available, where to find them, and then of course, increase diversity. So those are kind of things that, you know, I've been working working on with a variety of groups that were looking at trying to um, improve these things, you know, both from a healthcare provider and industry side, but as also, um, you know, approaching it from a patient view as well. So, um, and this is just a, an article that was written in one of the cardiology journals that talks about some of the barriers to involvement in clinical research and some of the things that we just talked about, about how to kind of look at solutions to that. So mistrust, um, lack of information, time and resource constraints, and how can we begin to think of creative ways to make sure that everyone's voice is heard and that everyone is counted so we can really understand MS better and hopefully ultimately have that lead to a cure for MS. All right, so let's talk about things that are going on. So cool things, I'm quickly gonna go through this. So the Minority Research Partnership Network is again that cool collaborative where we did that survey. But we've also been working on different tools to try to increase awareness about MS um, research and to increase understanding of research. And so we were able to do some focus groups, which are a really great experience where we talk to patients and kind of ask them about some of their hesitation about research or if they were interested. And what we often found is that many people wanted to be involved in research, but two of the major barriers were that they didn't know where to find out about studies, um, or their doctor didn't ask them about studies. Or in many cases, um, one other barrier that I didn't uh, fail to mention was levels of disability. So oftentimes, if an EDSS is over six, if you have difficulty walking, you're also automatically excluded from trials, and that's something that we need to rectify as well. 
This is a, an example of that. So I'm fortunate to be the chair of the steering committee for the CHIMES trial, which is the first minority focused MS clinical trial. And we're looking at um, black patients and Hispanic Latinx patients. There are about um, 30 sites across the US at different centers. And basically we're looking at a particular medication that's already approved, but again, will give us an opportunity to look at MS in a controlled setting in these populations and see if we can better understand why we're seeing some of the outcomes that we see in terms of worse disability. Other initiatives that are addressing underserved populations. Um, another group that I'm very fortunate to work with is called MS in the 21st Century. It's a global initiative that is uh, working to improve education between um, patients or people living with MS and their healthcare providers. And we have a couple of different themes that we've been focused on. Uh, the most recent one was progressive disease and improving communication about progression. Also, um, there are surveys about caregivers or care partners with MS, um, and there are certain tools that are there to help improve communication during doctor's visits, as well as to help people understand their MS better. So that's a really cool initiative that just came online in the US this summer. Um, before that, we weren't able to have access to it here in the States. And then another group is I Conquer MS, and they are a patient-driven research organization. So really focused on answering the questions that people with MS want answered. So as a researcher, although I feel like, you know, I'm doing my best to help the community, there often are questions that I may think are important that the MS community may not think are as important or there are other things that we need to be focused on. And so that's a really cool um, uh, organization that really helps kind of get a sense from the community what are some of the major issues that need to be addressed and then try to work with other partners to develop research studies to try to address those issues. Now, they do have a patient registry. It's not necessarily minority focus, but to help understand MS in the community as well. And then finally, um, my baby that I've been working on uh, probably really for the past 10 years, but diligently for the past three years, is the National African American MS Registry, which is finally online. Yay! So this is a project that I have wanted to see come to fruition for many years to try to help understand MS in the Black population. Um, and it is live where people can register and uh, also answer questionnaires so we can try to understand some of the risk factors, some of the patterns of treatment, time to diagnosis, et cetera. So I'm really excited about this, um, this work that has finally come online. And I have the website listed there. Um, it must be, I think you can't use it, in a, it doesn't work very well in Internet Explorer, um, but if you type in the whole um, web address, then you have access to that site. Okay, and then the last part of this section is that I want to stress the importance of hope. So we've come a long way, but we have a long way to go. I think that in this climate with so many different things going on um, in terms of social injustice, in terms of, you know, the pandemic and concern with health, I think there's a lot of focus on underserved communities. So I think that this is an extremely important time for us to collaborate and work on ways to improve the healthcare system so that more people have access to care and more people can live their best life within us. And with that, I will invite Stuart to come back up and we will see what questions you guys have before we move to the last COVID update. Hi, I'm back and I'm smiling. Isn't that cool? Great. Yes. So, so, so rare to see, right? We have a lot of questions. <laughs> we have a lot more okay. questions. We have people now writing in online, which is great because I have on paper and now we'll read from online as well. And for those um, that tuned in a little bit late. Sorry about that. But um, you could always go back and ask questions even for what took place earlier before you came on. And before you came on, we were talking or Dr. Williams was speaking about the multiple sclerosis in underserved and minority communities. So if you did miss out on that, and if you do have a question, please ask and I'm sure Dr. Williams will be happy to answer. All right. So first question, though. Um, it seems that as we age, there is a much larger difference between the categories. Is there any help available to older people in regards to mobility devices, aids for everyday tasks, and et cetera? So I would always encourage folks, you know, if you're having issues to first talk to your healthcare provider, you know, depending on the type of setting, there are often resources within um, some of our larger MS centers where they can help um, 
offer services to help with that or direct you to things like our foundations. I know, for instance, the MSAA and the MSF have had um, lending services where they may um, lend walkers or help to uh, with some of the costs of those types of things. So again, important to check in with your healthcare team because they may have access to local resources, um, but also to check in with our um, nonprofits to see if um, there are funds for some of those resources or lending um, libraries where people can um, obtain things until maybe it goes through with their insurance, so you know, so it's approved. Okay, my fault for going out of order on that question. So I'll, I should have held That's that okay. for the next category, right? I'm sorry about That's that. Okay. All right, so That's let's okay. go. To, let's go to what I have on paper first because it'll it'll help me to get through this. Um, yes. And actually, we're 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 going to bounce around. Okay, it's hard to uh, distinguish cool. what goes where right now. So first, no how to mixed how to mixed folks rate in these trials? Where do we stand? So one of the big challenges is to make sure that we are accurately describing ethnicity, right? So one of the big challenges is if someone is mixed race, let's say they are, you know, they have a parent who is of Northern European descent and they may have another parent who is, let's say, Black. Um, we have to make sure that we're capturing that. And so I think that there's some work that needs to be done. I think that, you know, one of the difficulties is that we are defining race and ethnicity based on physical characteristics and not on a genetic level. So when you look at a typical person who is considered African-American, about 80% of the genes are African and up to 20% are European. So I think that a better way for us to characterize or look at these things in the future is to really look at them on more of a genetic level. And then we can see what parts of the genetic ancestry are really affecting the outcomes in terms of, you know, some of the disability and things that we're seeing. Okay, thank you. So the next one is, is it true that Black people get MS worse? So from the research that we have, there are studies that suggest that there may be uh, increased disability in Black people with multiple sclerosis. We talked a little bit earlier about the walking, the EDSS of six, difficulty walking up to six to 10 years earlier than the white population. There are studies that look at MRI that talk about more burden of disease on MRI. Also studies that talk about more shrinkage of the brain more quickly. I think, however, the thing to keep in mind is that every person with MS is different, right? Whether they are black, whether they are Hispanic, Latinx, whether they're white or Asian. So we can't make a full generalization of any population. I have many black patients who've done great you know, and especially if we've gotten them on the appropriate therapy. But certainly what we see from the research we have, most of which are not clinical trials, is that there may be worse disease in a subgroup of Black people with MS. Okay, thank you for that. Um, how about the, the availability or, you know, we've heard a lot that minorities are not getting enrolled in COVID trials. Is there anything to be said of this? Absolutely. So, you know, I think that, again, it takes a lot of education in the community. Um, you know, there are a lot of factors that are related to low enrollment in clinical trials, particularly for the Black population. There's a very long history of discrimination in clinical trials and unfair experimentation. I've been reading a very interesting book called Medical Apartheid. Um, that talks about many of the medical advances um, and different types of surgeries that were performed on slaves and people of color, um, you know, with no anesthesia, kind of very cruel experiments that led to many of our major advances. And so I think that, you know, we have to begin to build a trusting relationship with minority communities to increase enrollment, but also we have to make sure that we're educating people about the importance of enrollment. And again, it being about um, helping the overall community and helping us to understand any disease process better. There was a trial that um, I believe Roche Genentech just uh, ended called the IMPACTA trial, where we also employed, where they also employed some of these measures looking at minority communities. And they had about 85% enrollment of Black people in that trial, and it was a COVID trial, and it was a positive trial. So the work can be done if people are focused and people are very intentional about reaching out to the communities. Okay, thank you. Is there anything going on for studies for Native Americans? So that's a very, very underserved group, and especially when you talk about COVID, 
Um, one that we don't hear about as much in the news, but one that has really been devastated by COVID because of the small numbers of people, as well as some of the living conditions um, with people not even having access to running water in some of the reservations, which precludes hand washing and also food deserts where it takes a long time to get to the grocery store and resources are not very accessible. Um, so I think that that's an area that we need to focus on. One of the things that I have been very aware of throughout my career is um, I had a, a, a mentor, a very wise person that always said, let's not make minorities a minority. So there are more minority groups than Black and Hispanic Latinx groups, which are kind of the most populous. Um, but I think that there are some groups that are focusing attention now on the Native American group. I do not have any specific trials that I'm aware of, but I know certainly in our partnership network that it is a focus that we've been um, turning toward in the past couple of, you know, in the past year is to try to look more at the Asian Pacific Islander groups and the N Native American groups. Thank you. Has the feedback mm -hmm. and research been positive when it comes to minorities using Ocrevus? Um, so I don't know that I can really speak to that. Um, you know, I know that for many of our medications, um, there have been sub analyses where we've looked at the minorities in the clinical trials. And so when we look at the small numbers of people who are in the clinical trials, not just for Ocrevus, but for some of our other therapies, such as um, dimethylfumarate, as well as natalizumab, when we've looked at those small numbers of people, they actually have performed very well compared to the general population. The problem is that the numbers are very small, which is why I'm hopeful that this child, trial that we're doing, the CHIMES trial, will give us some more information in a larger population of patients. All right. Um, next, thank you again. I mean, these these questions are good. The 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 answers are fantastic. A person now though is asking that I don't know really how this could be answered, but what do I need to do to stay healthy during pandemic that's different from everybody else? Well, I won't say that there's anything that's different from anybody else, but we need to employ the measures that we know are important. And we're going to talk about that in the next section, but making sure that we're washing our hands, making sure we're wearing a mask, trying to social distance as much as possible. The thing that I want to stress is that the pandemic is not over. There are over 211,000 dead people um, in the United States due to COVID-19. And I will talk about it in the next section, but I personally had COVID-19 and it is nothing to play with. I am fortunate that I have nearly fully recovered, but after three months, I'm still having some issues, you know, and I, I was a fairly healthy person before I got sick. So um, we don't want to play around with it. It's very serious. We need to be taking the precautions that the CDC and other agencies have recommended to try to stay safe. Thank you. What are the primary and secondary outcomes for CHIME? What are you looking to gain from this study? Great, great question. So the primary outcome is the re regular things that we're looking at, annualized relapse rate. Um, we're also looking secondarily at measures like MRI outcomes. We're looking at um, lesion burden on MRI. We're also looking at atrophy. And then we also have some more experimental outcomes. So we're looking at some genetic markers. We're also looking at populations of B cells. There is a sub-study where we will have um, up to 50 patients who will hopefully do lumbar punctures at least twice throughout the trial. And the goal of that is to look at things like oligoclonal bands, which have been shown to be higher in black populations. There are a lot of questions about the biology of MS and if it's slightly different or if it may be more driven by B cells in black people. And again, we don't have the answers to this. So we're hoping to maybe get some more information to inform um, some of our treatment patterns. So we've got um, primary, secondary, and we also have some experimental um, outcomes as well. Thank you for that. And before I forget, you need to send that information to me so I could get it posted on our website, all right? Absolutely. I, I Absolutely. definitely want to. I definitely want to put the uh, information of how people can register, and I definitely want to let our communities know on social media know about it as well. And I'm sure that it'll yeah. help with your overall studies. Okay. Absolutely. So, thank you. So the next thing is, a person's writing. I'm having leg numbness. It feels like a band around my calves. What's happening? Right. So I can't give specific medical advice, um, but what I can say is that there are different symptoms that lead to um, a type of squeezing sensation in the legs or in the arms. There are many people with MS who have a symptom called spasticity. 
Spasticity can um, come in a bunch of different forms. Sometimes it's a squeezing sensation or tightness. Sometimes it's an actual contraction like a kicking or a jerk. And then sometimes it's a soreness, like uh, people will say they feel like they worked out, um, but they didn't work out. And so it's important if you're having any new symptoms to always, always contact your healthcare provider and talk to them about the next steps that need to be done to address it. I guess that has to do the same then with people saying that they wanna know more about what they could do for pain, because that's another question yes. that's coming up. Okay, yes, absolutely. great, that answers that yeah. one. Mm -hmm. So next up, is there research on medical marijuana helping with spasticity? Yeah, so there is. So, um, you know, so we're getting more and more studies about medical marijuana. Um, and I get lots and lots of questions about it. Honestly, I haven't updated myself in the past couple of months um, about medical marijuana. But, you know, there are studies um, that we've seen from Europe looking at the oil forms of uh, cannabinoids, the chemical the, uh, that is pr the primary chemical in marijuana. And there are studies that suggest that that compound does help spasticity and in some cases nerve pain. I think one of the biggest issues with the US, it's legal in some places, not legal in some places. Um, there are some things to be desired in terms of regulation, how much chemical is in there. And um, when we talk about at least the smoked form of, of marijuana that has a lot of THC, which is the active component that gives people kind of that high, um, you know, there are some concerns about it. So concerns about the smoke, um, also concerns about the fact that it can affect or slow cognition if someone already has slow cognition. You know, so I think that there's still a lot of work that needs to be done, but I'm very hopeful that we'll get some good research, especially in the areas where MS is legal. Uh, I'm sorry, not MS is legal, <laughs> where marijuana is legal. Um, and so we can do some more controlled studies to try to understand the effects of different forms of the chemical um, and which ones are the best ones to actually treat the symptoms without affecting the other symptoms like fatigue and cognition. Great, thank you. Can we have you mm -hmm. here with us until like 8.15 because there's That's a lot fine. more questions to go through. Okay, great. Yeah. We got 80 people yeah. online. I mean, this is fantastic, you know? So, awesome. um, all right, next question. One quarter of MS patients are now seniors and many are progressing to SPMS. Affordable housing, costs of pres prescription drugs and assistive devices are on the rise. Access to home care, physical and occupational therapy is limited. Medicare and Medicaid coverage is causing many financial difficulties. What are your thoughts? We got a lot of work to do, right? So, you know, I think that again, in some cases, some of our societies and foundations I know that the MS Society has a MS Navigator program, which is almost like a kind of case management program where they can assist with finding services that are in your area. I think, unfortunately, we have to kind of piece things together. It's kind of a hodgepodge. So someone may be able to get assistance for a walker here. They may be able to get assistance for home care here. I think the biggest issues or disconnects that I see are for folks who actually need someone in the home. So Medicare does not cover home health aids, but Medicaid does. And so we have a lot of challenges for our patients who need someone to come maybe a couple of times a week, maybe help them get a bath, help with some of their daily activities. Um, and unfortunately it has to come out of pocket. So I think that we have a lot of work to do in trying to improve the resources available um, for some of these issues. And I have a lot of folks that unfortunately are in you know, very bad situations um, because they don't have access to some of those services that will really make their daily life a lot easier. Okay, thank you. All right, next question. My first MS doctor back in the 80s told me at diagnosis, go home and eat well, rest, keep moving, keep your stress under control, take care of any comorbidity issues, but there is nothing more than I have in my arsenal to give you. 30 plus years post onset, I have SPMS. Is the advice the same? No. So in the 80s, there wasn't anything we could do, right? So again, MS is a disease that we've known about since the 1800s. So 1868, uh, Dr. Charcot, who is considered the father of neurology and had a lot of free times on his hand and spent a lot of time at the hospital. Um, but he was one of the first people to kind of put together the symptoms with the pathology of MS, the symptoms and the lesions. 
And so we've known about the disease since 1868. There were no FDA approved therapies until 1993. And the first medicine that came on the market, beta seron, was there was a lottery for it. So we've come a very long way. So in the 80s, um, there wasn't very much that we could offer um, in terms of treatment. Now we have a multitude of different treatment options that we can offer. So the advice is so so part of the advice is the same, right? So go home, you know, make sure you eat well, exercise. We want you to rest, we want you to keep your stress down. But in addition, now we have a variety of options that we can offer that can help treat the actual immune inflammatory response. Okay, thank you for that. How can I learn mm -hmm. to improve communication with social media as an older as being an older adult? So it depends on what your objective is, right? So my mom calls me almost every day about her Facebook page and how to post something on her page or something like that. You know, so it depends. I think that there are ways that we can stay connected, right? You know, social media is a great way to stay connected. Social media can also make you super depressed and feel horrible just depending on what you're looking at. So I think that we have to kind of balance, you know, the types of information that we're looking at. But I think that there are many MS communities. Uh, Stuart has a very active Facebook group group and Facebook page where people are often posting different things. They have different educational programs. So it can be a really great source of information about programs, different treatment options, um, and different things that are going on in the MS community. So I think that, you know, if you start with Facebook, that's a good way to go. That's one of the easiest ones to use. Um, and I think that, you know, there's really a video online about everything, how to set up a page, how to look right. for something. If you just type MS in the search bar, you can find a variety of groups. So start with Stuart, start with MS Views and News, um, and then you. you can go from there and find a lot of other resources. So we have seven different pages on Facebook. We are on Twitter. We are on Instagram. We are on LinkedIn. And somebody gave me the name of something else the other day that I don't even remember it, and I have no clue. I've never heard of it before, but we'll have to wait on that. Okay, so uh -huh. next question. Thank you for all the uh, kudos, though. And um, yeah, all right. Next question is: I would like information that includes the senior MS patients. Older patients often have less access to care and social activity, more physical disability, and other illnesses to contend with. What can you advise? So again, you know, looking to groups like MS Views and News, um, also looking to our societies and foundations. And I am the queen of saying, if it doesn't exist, that means somebody needs to create it. I do not know of a um, particular MS community for people over the age of 55. Um, or who are considered old. I mean, I don't think 55 is old. I mean, old gets real. The only gosh. person I think is old right now is my granny who's 93. So she's old, but everybody under 93 is not old. But, you know, for folks who are not in our traditional, you know, 18 to 55 range, if there's not a group, it sounds like it's a great time for someone to create it. So I've heard several questions about that. So maybe that's something that could be a collaborative that comes out of a program like this. Hey, I'm 61 and I am not at high risk, okay? Yeah, I, am, you're I, not I refuse old. to put myself in that group. So, um, you're not you, know, old. Uh, you keep saying 55, though, and I'm like, uh oh, I'm in trouble here now. Well, All so right, 55 so, is over the age for our trial. So, that is just a marker of what we use for our clinical trials, but not in any way uh, uh, a, uh, a uh, pronouncement of elderly. So, that leads to something that comes up at many of our in-person meetings, all right? There's uh -huh. often that somebody brings the question and it's not written here right now, but I'm gonna say it anyway, because for those that are online, I'm sure that they would love to hear this answer. There are many MS neurologists, well, not MS neurologists, there are, there are many neurologists around the country that feel that their elder patients should be taken off of an MS medication because maybe their disease is not as active as it once was and they just, a lot of people just give in to that. And I don't know what to say about it. I mean, I do know what to say about it, but I'm not the doctor here tonight. You are. I'm not a doctor. You are. And um, I'm going <laughs> right. to let you answer that because, um, you know, they, they, my simple answer is go find a new doctor, you know, but um, you're up. 
Okay, so great question. And sometimes that is the answer, right? So I, I'm, I'm a big advocate of people seeking a second opinion. Um, especially for major decisions like that. I have had cases where I've had patients who've been very stable for like 20 years, you know, who've had MS for 30, 40 years, and maybe something comes up and we say, okay, maybe this is a time to come off of therapy. But by and large, my general thought is if it ain't broke, don't fix it. The good news is that there are several studies um, that are being conducted in different parts of the states to try to answer this question. So I think the best way to answer it is with research. So there are several studies. I know there's one at Cleveland Clinic that is trying to help us answer this question. You know, does MS really burn out after a certain period of time? You know, and again, we have to weigh the risks versus the benefits of therapy. As we get older, our immune systems change. We may be more at risk for infections. Are the medicines doing more harm than good? And the honest answer is we don't know. But certainly if there's any concern, it never hurts to seek a second opinion um, before making a major decision like that. Thank you. Last question yep. of this topic. Should people with MS go to a regular neurologist in their hometown? Or if they, since they may not have an MS center or MS neurologist, should they travel to an MS center or to a MS neurologist that is known in a larger city? So there are many general neurologists. So most MS is cared for by general neurologists. And there are many general neurologists who are very good at caring for MS. I'm a big advocate for everyone at least at at least once during the course of their disease seeing a specialist, right? I think it doesn't hurt to see a specialist once. Um, you know, depending on the level of confidence you have with your neurologist who is uh, doing your care. I've had people with all kinds of arrangements. I've had some people who have had a general neurologist come to see me and stay with me and travel three or four hours every so often. I had a lady who used to fly from Morocco to come and see me in Atlanta every six months, right? Um, and then I had some people who did a combination where they would see their general neurologist because if you have someone that's local, if you have to go into the hospital, they will have privileges at the local hospital, whereas your MS neurologist who lives in another city would not. So helping kind of coordinate symptoms if you're having issues locally. Um, I have a lot of folks who had a combination. They would come see me every six months and they had another neurologist locally that they would see every six months and we kind of alternate like that. And then I have other folks who would come and see me for a second opinion, look over the records. I'm like, hey, I would do the same thing as your neurologist back home. And then they go back and follow with their general neurologist. So, you know, they're all kind of different combinations. It just depends on your comfort level, you know, your ability to access care. But usually if someone lives more than a couple of an hour or so from a major center, I recommend they do consider having a local neurologist because if you get into trouble at home, it's going to be very difficult for you to drive an hour to get an infusion um, or, you know, drive an hour to get admitted to a hospital out of town. True. Thank you for that. Now, before we get to the last topic, I just want to let everybody know that Mitzi Williams, Dr. Mitzi Williams, will be presenting also, along with four other people, at the upcoming MS Annual Symposium. This is an event that for 10 years, we did this here in South Florida. And we are now, like everything else, going virtual with this. And so we already have over 300 people registered to be on this event, which begins at 10 o'clock in the morning on Saturday the 17th. And again, we have five different presenters. Each one will be speaking for 35 minutes each, followed by Q and A's for each one. All right, and then we will get through the whole day. And, and Dr. Williams is speaking second, Dr. Thrower is speaking first. We have a patient advocate that's speaking third. We have a psychologist speaking fourth. And then we have Dr. Aaron Boster speaking fifth. Okay, so if anybody is on here right now that does not know about it, please visit our website, the MS Views and News website, msvn.org, and you can sign up for the event from there. Okay, now we're going to get to our last topic here, and that is about COVID MS, COVID 19 and MS. All right, and Dr. Williams, I'm going to disappear. Okay, go. Okay. Have fun. All right, Bye. got it. All right, so we're gonna zip through this piece. We've got some real, we've had some really good questions um, tonight, and I'm I'm glad that I was able to kind of spend this time speaking with you guys. Um, but we're gonna get through this um, last section, and then we'll take a couple more questions. So the first thing I always start with with talking about COVID. 
is that our understanding of COVID-19 is a work in progress. You know, so what we're understanding about different populations at risk changes very rapidly. And so the information that I'm going to talk about today is from what we currently know, but recognize that that may change. So again, as we're having more trials, as we're seeing more different cases and we're getting more people enrolled in our um, MS registries that are focused on COVID-19, we are understanding more and more about how this may behave in a, the MS population. Okay, so first of all, who can be affected with COVID? The answer is anybody. And so I like this graphic because it really kind of helps us to understand the spread of COVID. So let's say this person that's infected is an asymptomatic carrier, right? So we see the red infected circle over that guy's head. And then we see the blue circle over somebody who may have had it and is immune. And then we see this other circle over the healthy person. What can happen when you mix all those folks together is that asymptomatic people can pass on the disease to healthy folks who, who didn't have the disease and can make them sick. You know, and because of the lag of the onset, right, two to 14 days before we may see symptoms, you know, a person who is asymptomatic can really spread the disease to a lot of people um, un unknowing to them um, if they are in contact with folks, especially if there are no masks and there's no social distancing, especially at a very crowded scene like this scene here. So again, who can be affected? Anybody. Dr. Mitzi has had COVID-19 and I likely got it from work, but honestly, I don't know where I got it from. And so one day I came home, I had a fever of 103 and almost passed out in my dining room um, and went through a series of fevers for a week and pneumonia and was very sick for about three months. Now, again, that's not everybody's case, but we do need to understand that it can be very serious for many folks. I was fortunately did not have to be hospitalized, which was a blessing, but I have many friends who did get sick and even close friends who's um, one lady that um, is a close family friend, her whole family, her two brothers, sisters, and her mom all died um, from COVID infection. So who's at risk for more severe course of disease with COVID? So if we look at the CDC, um, adults over the age of 65. So Stuart, that does not include you. Um, those with a history of asthma, such as myself, I do have asthma, um, with obesity, underlying medical conditions, such as um, uncontrolled diabetes, kidney disease, or who are immunocompromised. And then there are similar um, recommendations in terms of the WHO as to the WHO as to who may be at increased risk. When we look at COVID-19 and MS, so I just, just for you guys, updated myself from our most recent Ectrums conference. I listened to a two-hour lecture about COVID-19. And so what we can find from most of our MS registries is that the factors that were associated with poor outcomes with COVID-19 were folks who are of older age, over 65. Some of those who had progressive disease may, be at, may have been at higher risk for um, poorer outcomes with COVID-19, meaning either hospitalization or hospitalization or ICU admission, hospitalization, ICU admission, or in some cases, mortality. Also, if you look at higher levels of disability, seem to be associated with poorer outcomes. Um, interestingly enough, those who were not treated for their MS, who were not on disease-modifying therapies, did seem to be at increased risk for poorer outcomes with several of our registry data sets. Black patients, and we'll talk about a little bit about that. So um, the COVID-MS registry, which is the US registry looking at MS, did a, a very interesting presentation about how black patients here in the US were more likely to contract COVID and have poor outcomes such as hospital admission and ICU admission. There was not a difference in mortality, um, in terms of death, but in terms of more severe course of disease, there was a difference between the black and white populations. And I think the most interesting, hot, not the most interesting, but one of the um, bigger hot topics over the past couple of weeks since the conference has been about anti-CD20 therapy, such as rituximab and ocrelizumab. Um, there was a presentation from the global database, and I'm just going to look at my notes real quick, from the global database for MS, the Global Sharing um, Initiative, and they had over um, 6,000, um, sorry, they had over 1,500 patients with COVID um, and MS, and this is an initiative between many different countries, including the U.S., Canada, and many of the countries in Europe. 
Um, and so they had 1,540 patients, about 300 were in the hospital, 76 went to the ICU, 54 were on the ventilator at some point, and there were 48 deaths among those patients. And so what they found was for those who were more likely to have hospital admissions, they were older, um, males were a little bit, I'm sorry, females were a little less likely to be admitted to the hospital, progressive disease and um, higher levels of disability. Um, and then when they looked at um, anti-CD20 therapies, people who took rituximab had a higher um, rate of hospitalization, ICU admission, um, and ventilation, but there were no differences in mortality or death. And they also saw a, a little bit of a higher risk of hospital admission uh, for those who were taking ocrelizumab, but again, um, it was not statistically significant like it was for rituximab, which is a drug that's very similar to ocrelizumab. So those are very, very interesting results. When we looked at the data um, that actually came from um, the company that makes ocrelizumab, um, they released their information of about 51 uh, patients from the clinical trials who had COVID. They also had about um, 300 folks who were post-marketing with COVID. Um, and then they had, uh, again, uh, folks who were over the age of 50 had more um, hospital admissions. Um, and then they had, I think about, um, 17 fatalities out of all of those patients. So in some cases, there seemed to be a big difference in how people performed in terms of their risk for COVID, you know, for hospitalization with um, anti-CD20 therapies. And then in other cases, it seemed like they performed very similar to the general population. So again, this is an, a revelation in progress and we're finding out more information on a fairly regular basis. Um, but so far, as from the registry presentations, which were the UK registry, they talked about the Swedish registry, the French registry, and the US registry. Um, these were some of the highlights from the most recent uh, meeting. Um, again, so I talked a little bit about each of these registries. The UK registry was very interesting. So they presented data from folks who had been, um, you know, who had MS. Um, and who developed COVID-19 within the time of their lockdown. So they had a pretty extensive lockdown of the country, um, and they still are not seeing a lot of patients in person. I talked to one of my colleagues over there, and still the majority of their patients are being seen via telehealth, and they're seeing very few people in person to try to um, decrease the risk for infection. And so what they found from their data, when people had precautions in place, such as self-isolation, social distancing, they really didn't see any differences in the rate of MS um, patients developing COVID-19 um, versus the general population. They also didn't see any difference in hospitalizations, ICU admissions, or fatality compared to the general population when those lockdown measures were in place. The COVID-MS registry, as I said, reported data about Black patients who did worse with COVID in terms of um, hospitalizations, ICU admissions um, versus the white population. And then the Global Sharing Initiative shared data that suggested that some anti-CD20 um, antibody medicines may put people at risk for poor outcomes, hospitalization, ICU admission, but not mortality. So social distancing, I like this graphic, right? It's important, okay? I know that um, people are very tired of being cooped up in a house. And I think that all of us, you know, have our places that we may go or travel to where we feel comfortable, people that we allow in and out of our homes that we may feel comfortable with. Um, but I think that social distancing is still key because it's just like this fire here, right? So if we can pull one match down, it keeps the fire from spreading across. And so someone asked about what we can do to stay safe and prevent infection. The same things that everyone else is doing, right? Washing our hands frequently with soap and water. Make sure that we're practicing physical distancing, not attending huge gatherings of people, um, especially that are not wearing masks. Try to avoid touching our face, our eyes and our nose if our hands are not clean. Um, if we're sneezing or coughing, not doing that in anybody's face. Um, and then again, a lot of people ask me about work and it really depends on um, what medications you're taking and having a conversation with your doctor about the setting that you're working in. If that is a safe um, setting, um, if that may potentially put you at increased risk for infection and kind of what are the things that you can do about that. 
Um, other thing that I like to highlight when I talk about COVID is mental health services is very stressful. So the pandemic has been extremely stressful, um, especially if you're talking about things like social isolation um, and access to care. Many of my patients, especially those that get infusions, that's kind of where they get to go hang out with their friends. You know, um, and many of the programs that we had, such as the MS Views and News programs, other programs that we did in person where people could really socialize are no longer, um, you know, live programs. So it's important to take care of your mental health during this time. So I certainly recommend that people contact their doctors if they're having any symptoms of depression. And then I put some of the resources here, um, um, virtual webinars, virtual support groups, there are different podcasts and certainly mental health providers can be very helpful. And this is a, a list of great sources of information. Uh, you'll see the second to bottom is MS Views and News, but certainly if we're looking for good, valid information, remember everything that's on Facebook is not necessarily true. Everything you see on the internet is not necessarily true. So we want to look for trusted sources of information um, that are vetted by people who want to make sure that people are not getting incorrect information. And this is a list of just some of the resources that you can look to We lost you again. Your microphone did something wrong. Uh, something wrong with oh, my mic? Now you're back. Now you're back. Now you're Am back. I back. Can you hear me? Now you're back. Yeah. yeah. Can you hear me? Okay, yeah. You know the, this is the last little, slide. In. You know is, that little button on there? You might be touching that every now and then. Yeah, it might be it might be my hair. My my hair. It might be. You know, doing the most. It might be my hair is doing. But you can stay up because we're almost done. Um oh, this is uh That's you know, really these are registries fun. that people can be involved in. Um, for COVID-19. So there's a registry through I Conquer MS that has a COVID-19 survey. And then there are doctors um, ha that have uh, portals that they can work on to um, help increase information and knowledge about COVID-19. And I've been really impressed with the scientific community because there has really been a unity um, from people from all different countries to try to share information so that we can better understand MS. Um, and understand COVID-19 in the MS population. All right, stay connected. So this is how you find me. I am the Nerdy Neurologist um, on Facebook and Instagram and Nerdy Neuro MD on Twitter. I have a YouTube channel. Um, and I have a website, so um, I have lots of cool videos um, that I talk about different topics related to MS. Um, and um, I'm looking forward to a new collaboration, hopefully with blackdoctor.org. Well, I have a weekly show where I talk about different topics of MS and hopefully have some of my super friends like Stuart come on and talk about different um, parts of MS in the community. So thank you so much for your time and attention. And I guess I will hand it back over to Stuart and we'll see if there are any questions about COVID um, that I didn't address in the talk. Great, thank you and very much. And even if you always, Go this ahead. is my last slide as always. All I need is peace, love, and a freaking cure for MS. So, okay, that's the last slide. All right, here we go. Awesome, awesome. Thank you for all your wonderful presentations here tonight. I'm hoping that, I'm pretty sure that everybody got something out of this, at least uh, over one topic or another. And um, there might be, you know, some of these questions, they might be asked from something that you already spoke about, but if you could just readdress it, then that would be great. All right, so. The first one is, are MS patients taking DMTs that affect the immune system more or more at risk or poor outcomes from COVID-19 infection? So great question. So far, the only one where we've seen that there may potentially be more poor outcomes has been the anti-CD20 um, medications, the two that I talked about, rituximab and ocrelizumab. Rituximab, um, is an older medicine that is not FDA approved for MS, but has been commonly used with M for MS, especially before ocrelizumab was approved. So there was a statistically significant difference in hospital admission and ICU admission, not death, okay, 
Um, and there was a trend toward more hospital and ICU admission for those who were on ocrelizumab. So far, we have not seen any differences. Interestingly enough, it seemed like maybe the folks who were on interferon did a little bit better because interferon has some antiviral properties. But there are some studies that are looking at interferon um, and COVID-19 that we haven't seen the data from yet. Thank you. So here's an interesting question, very interesting. Once a person expires, dies from COVID-19, would there still be infection if a body is cremated? No idea. I have no idea. That is a great question, but I have no idea. I've not great seen question. any data on that. Okay. Next, if I have temperature from MS and thyroid, how do you, how do you differentiate so, you know, so as, I mean, so people have temperature sensitivities, but MS usually doesn't make someone have a fever. A fever is a temperature above 100.4. Um, and the fevers that we typically see with COVID are very high, like the one I had was 103. So they're very high fevers, and we don't tend to see those extremely high temperatures with just, um, with MS um, or with thyroid disease. But if you ever have a fever, um, which is a temperature, again, above 100.4, you should contact your doctor for concern about infection. I know a lot of people that have lower body temp with multiple sclerosis than the general public. What then would mm -hmm. you say is the gauge for saying when they actually have a fever? So again, a fever is a fever. So if it's 100.4, if it's over 100.4, it's a fever. There's not really data to suggest, even if people have slightly lower body temperatures, um, you know, uh, there's really not data to suggest that, you know, less than 100.4 would be a fever. Um, so again, um, we usually see very high temperatures that are clearly, clearly fevers um, if someone has COVID-19 even for those who may have a slightly lower body temperature. Okay, thank you. Could mm -hmm. COVID risk for another other meds with low, I don't understand this. Uh, could, I say, I keep saying could, COVID risk for other meds with low abs and lymphs? I'm not Absolute understanding. Uh, so could COVID, COVID risk be increased for people on other medications where they have low absolute lymphocyte counts? Um, again, we've not seen the evidence, so there hasn't really been a systematic study that's looked at absolute lymphocyte counts and risk for COVID, but as I said, the only therapies where we so far have seen any difference in hospitalization is with the anti-CD20, um, and so we have not seen it with our other medications, even those that cause a low lymphocyte count, like our okay. S1P inhibitors. Okay, thank you for that. There's uh, about five or six questions remaining. Will MS okay. patients that get COVID have other lasting effects along with respiratory effects? I mean, so people can have lasting effects with COVID if they don't have MS, you know. So um, the honest answer is we're seeing, at least in the scientific community, folks who are what we call COVID long haulers. And um, unfortunately, I have a good friend of mine who um, got COVID and got reinfected and has permanent lung damage, who's a young, healthy person. Um, you know, and can no longer work as a physician who does not have MS. So there's really not a way to predict. Again, we have not seen significant differences in outcomes so far with those who have MS, aside from the factors that we talked about um, with higher levels of disability. So, it, you know, it, it's a possibility, but we've not seen that related directly to a person having MS. Thank you. Are there any MS drugs being overlooked, being looked at in in terms of treatment for COVID, any MS drug companies working on a vaccination? So I believe that Merck, which makes uh, Mavenclad and Rebif is working on a vaccination. Um, two drugs are in clinical trials, interferon beta and fingolimod are in trials as possible treatments for COVID. Okay, thank I you. I haven't heard any results reported out from that yet. Is there anything specific that would help us and those around us to protect against the virus? Wear a mask, don't go to crowded places, wash your hands. Hot water. Hot is there water. any water temperature that you, uh, so this is a question that many in smaller communities around the United States might not have as hot of water that 
is expected to be used for washing the hands. What do you have to say and what can people do that have that situation? Um, great question. I mean, I think I don't have any scientific evidence. I mean, my sense is that as long as the water is warm um, and as long as you are washing your hands and scrubbing your hands for 20 seconds, you should rinse them off. I, I don't know that there's a risk for water that's hotter versus water that's colder, honestly. But it's really about the length of time that you spend washing and making sure you get all the areas and all the cracks and crevices in your hands um, good and clean before you rinse them off. Okay, thank you. How many MS people have been affected by COVID-19 and what is the recovery rate of those getting it? Did you ask answer that earlier? Yeah, so the global so the global data sharing initiative um, had about 1,500 patients with COVID and about 74% of them had recovered at the time that they present the data a couple weeks ago. Okay, thank you. Um, if a person is coughing and they're saying that they only have a cold, that they've been tested negative recently, and um, what do you say about them attending an event such as the one we're doing tomorrow night? Not tomorrow night, Thursday night. So, you know, I don't recommend that anybody that's sick attend, you know, live events, right? So whether you have a cold, colds are contagious too, that's you right. know, so whether you have a cold, whether you have the flu, I think it's very important for us to make sure that we're taking care of our health and that if we're sick, we're not exposing other people to our illnesses, right? There are many communicable diseases, meaning diseases that can spread, you know, aside from COVID, right? There are common colds, there is the flu, you know, so we just need to make sure if we don't feel well, that we try to stay at home. Which is exactly what we told people um, that uh, on our, you know, last reminders about being at this event is that even if they have sniffles, even if they have sneeze and think that they it's don't. allergies, we don't want them there. We don't want the. We don't want the crud. We don't want the crud. We don't. We don't want anything. We don't want to. We don't want to even have to question why we were just in the room. Right. You know. So we're right. we're asking everybody not to attend, and um, uh, you know, if they if they feel anything like that. All right. Uh, right. Another question or two just came in. I'm in a rural community, and I hang clothes on the line. Are there any concerns for me doing that with COVID? Not to my knowledge. Okay, next one. Oh, I'm not answering that one. That's political. All right, um, we're not asking that. All right, next. Um, again, going back to masks. Are there any specific masks that should not be worn other than Halloween masks? <laughs> Halloween masks are scary. Um, there have been some reports about the masks with the filters that they may increase the likelihood of someone getting the virus. Um, I've not seen real definitive evidence about that, but I certainly have seen some kind of case reports that maybe the mask with the filters where it has a little area that has the air on it um, may not be as safe as a mask that just completely covers your face. Obviously, a mask with a filter is easier to breathe with, um, but certainly if you have something that's covering your nose and your mouth, that's going to be extremely important. So to make sure that if you're wearing it, that it's not under your nose, that it's not under your chin, that it's over your nose and your mouth. So it's funny that you just mentioned that because in what we put out there for people knowing how to dress to come to our event, our live event on Thursday night, they had a sign off to me that they understand that they will be wearing a facial covering or a face mask, a medical mask that covers their nose and their mouth, except while they're mm -hmm. eating or having something to drink. So before right. the food comes, they must be like that. After the food is cleared, they must put their you know, facial coverings back on again. So, mm -hmm. um, and, and things to keep in mind, right? So sometimes after you've worn a mask for a little bit of time, it can get loose. You can always kind of tie a loop around the string behind one or both of your ears to tighten it up. And also when you wear those surgical masks, that little top part is mm. bendable. Okay. And so, you know, when you put it on, you can bend that top part around your nose so that it fits your face better than just kind of putting it straight across and then it's falling down under your nose. So you can bend that little top part. It has a little kind of bendy like piece in the in the top of it um, so that you can make it fit better. Sure, thank you. And for those that are still wearing face coverings that they can breathe through and blow out a candle, uh, should they be wearing it or should they not be wearing it? Is it no. still doing something to cover to stop their spread? I mean, I don't know what kind of face covering you can wear where you could blow out a candle and it 
is helping you. A very light lycra or whatever. I've seen yeah. them. Yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, okay. so again, something over your face is good, but certainly the two ply, like the little surgical masks, are probably a little bit more protective than one layer. Okay. And one last thing that was asked of me, can we trust the KN95s coming in from China? So I saw some reports that some of them are not up to U.S. standards. Um, but again, you know, a, a true N95 should seal the face, right? So the, the, the most protective covering is one that literally seals on the face where it almost feels like it's suffocating you. I know because I have to wear one all day when I do my clinics at the hospital. Um, yeah. and it, it does feel like it's suffocating you. However, there are lots of other face coverings that you can wear. So a KN95 is still a two-ply mask. Um, it just may not be the same standard as an N95, which literally seals around your nose and around your face and is, is tight so that nothing can get in or out. So speaking about those sealing the face, I was fortunate to be able to come across KN95s made in the United States. Four-ply. Oh my God! Yeah, you, yeah. You, you, it's such a hard difficulty breathing out of it. It's like it's very hard. I don't to know breathe. how the, I don't know how they wear them in the hospitals. I, I applaud the doctors you that just, can do this all day long, but it's like I can make barely it work. get out. In the, in the 95 degree heat, it was impossible to wear outside. So. Yeah, you make it work. Yeah, yeah it's very tough. Yeah. All right. So again, I want to thank you. I want to thank everybody for being thank here tonight. You. I want to again thank those that supported this program. We have Genentech EMD Serono, Bristol Myers Squibs, um, Sanofi Genzyme, and Biogen. And yes, I want to thank them all. And I got people online thanking us for doing this. And so thank you again, Dr. Williams. I look forward to having you on our program on October 17th. And in the meantime, if anybody does not know, we are doing October 8th virtually as well as in person. So that is with Dr. Boster. And if you haven't seen it, you haven't gotten signed up for it, you can go to our website right now and click on the links on the right side of the page to get signed up for that program. So you will see that virtually on Thursday evening, Eastern time, it begins at 6.15 p.m. Okay, and Dr. Williams, Again, thank you for everything you do. Thank I can't you. wait to see you again one day in person. Yes. All right. Yes, and, yes, yes. Uh, in the meantime, we get the pleasure of having to do this online virtually, and uh, and that's it. All right. It's time for me to go to sleep. Absolutely. All right. I got to be up in seven. All hours. right. All right. You got thank it. you. Have a good night. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. <laughs>